y'all, Scott here. Apparently my input on wars throughout history is extremely important, so it finally makes sense why after the French Revolution in most history textbooks it just says, but what would Scott think? It's the middle of class in 2011, and all these kids are discussing politics. Which is better, the PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360? One of them asks, Scott, which one do you prefer? And you ruin your credibility. Nintendo. Platform wars will forever be a thing. When you don't have anything better to do in your life, why not defend plastic? I mean, when you blow thousands of dollars on a new computer or phone, you don't want to actively admit, yeah, yours is better, I'm the idiot. You want to make sure your purchase is justified and have everybody agree with you that the way you spend $400 is better than how I spend $400. This kind of debate is especially prevalent between platforms that are largely similar, but have various minor pros and cons between each of them. And nowhere was that more of a thing than with the console wars of the seventh generation of video games consoles. Five entered the ring. One was a runaway success, we don't count that. The other two were portable systems, they had their own fish to fry, so we were left with two systems, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Video game fans have always been pit against each other based on the consoles they used each and every generation, but never before were two consoles so perfectly balanced between their strengths and weaknesses. One console did well in one area, while the other faltered, but the other did well in an area the other couldn't even spell right. It's still up for debate nowadays which one is better. It's a very similar situation to what happened with the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo back in the 90s. The difference was, the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were more so civil tyrants, the Genesis and Super Nintendo were only interested in what each other's blood tasted like. Console wars have definitely settled down between the companies over the years, what once was a war turned into a competitive picnic. But the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 were truly out to get each other. They didn't like each other one bit, which meant I know what I'm gonna do tonight. I'm gonna recall the history of these consoles duking it out, and afterwards we'll pit the two against each other in a variety of categories to see which one I end up personally preferring, I plan the best parties. The video game landscape and who was on top was and still is consistently changing. Atari was king until they were stupid, Nintendo overtook gaming for a while until Sega came along with the Genesis and actually outsold Nintendo's offerings for a bit there until they tried to succeed so hard they failed. Nintendo took over again, but then Sony came into the picture with the PlayStation and that blew up. If anything, this shows that when a new generation of systems comes along, it's up in the air who'll take the crown. It's never always Nintendo or always Sony, but it's never Sega. So, if you have the resources to create a video game console, go for it. F***ing go for it. You have nothing to lose except everything. You have the potential to be the best selling game console of all time, I'm telling my kids that. So when Sony was working on their next console, the PlayStation 2, Microsoft entered the ring by announcing the Xbox. That should give Sony a run for their money. I'm sure Sony keeps this photo on their nightstand. What happened here? I mean, it makes sense for Sony to win, but by this much? Well, lots of things added to this happening. While I made the point that just because a company did well one generation doesn't mean that success will transfer over to the next, that most certainly happened here. The PlayStation was a huge hit, over 100 million consoles sold, with the next one on the horizon being definitively called the PlayStation 2, what did you think would happen? It's like everybody loves bread. Bread 2 comes out, it's gonna sell well. The PS2 launched in the year 2000. Microsoft released the Xbox one year later, so not only did Sony get a year's head start on Microsoft, which meant by the time the Xbox released, the PS2 already had a year's worth of games in its library, but they also had brand recognition on their side. People knew what a PlayStation was. The Xbox scared people. Plus, DVDs were getting big at the time. The PlayStation 2 was a DVD player straight out the box. It had amazing exclusive games, plus pretty much all the third-party games you could possibly ask for. Even though the Xbox had a lot of these things going for it, they were only in spirit. It could play DVDs, as long as you bought the DVD remote accessory. Without this, you couldn't play DVDs. That was stupid. It had exclusive games. It had third-party stuff, but most exclusives, well, not bad, it didn't really shake the world, and a lot of the biggest third-party games, while well, running and looking far better on the Xbox, came out a while after the PS2 versions did. This little guy put up a fair fight, but it obviously wasn't going to beat out the PlayStation 2. By the time it came out, Sony basically already won that generation. But of course, Microsoft wasn't discouraged by getting second place. People love this thing. Look at it. It's so buff. For a first timer, the Xbox did quite well. It beat out Nintendo's GameCube in terms of sales, and it did have at least one exclusive series that mattered, Halo. Most third-party games you'd want to play that generation did eventually come to the system. For a newcomer console, the Xbox did about as well as it could have possibly done. And Microsoft had the deep pockets to support it. I mean, this system rarely turned a profit, ever. They may have sold a decent amount of them, but they were losing money on this thing. For most companies, if their first console didn't turn a profit, they normally say, let's get out of here. But Microsoft can afford to do anything they want. They have an endless supply of money. They can launch a game console, go to space, go bankrupt, whatever they want. They have so much money, and the Xbox supplanted itself as a worthwhile brand, so Microsoft did the unthinkable. 
they never learned to count. The Xbox 360 was revealed on May 12th, 2005 on MTV because TBS was busy that day. Microsoft was serious with making this system a massive deal and something that Sony should have been legitimately scared of. Instead, they were pretty confident with their next console, the PlayStation 3 success. I mean, after your last two systems were the most popular systems in history, it's easy to get a big head and think anybody will buy something with the word Sony on it. Shortly after the Xbox 360's reveal, Sony revealed info on the PS3, how it was leaps and bounds more technologically advanced than Microsoft's offerings. I mean, this thing had it all. Two USB ports, three more USB ports, another USB port. The entire system was built around something called the cell processor, which was a highly advanced technology that nobody knew how to use. It was pretty difficult for programmers to actually utilize the cell processor and make games for it, but Sony was so arrogant after the past two generations, there was this mentality that developers would learn to program for it because we made the PlayStation 2, everybody loves us. Like, if the cell processor takes a lot of time to figure out, developers will spend all their time making games for the PS3 because it's so difficult, they won't have time to make games for the Xbox 360. Sony knew they had brand recognition on their side, so decided to make the ultimate video game box. Backwards compatible with all generations of PlayStation, the most powerful architecture imaginable, a compact flash card reader because f you, you need that. They weren't constructing the world's most video game console, they were making a government supercomputer. It could do anything and everything you'd want a thing to do. It could play the up-and-coming high-def Blu-ray discs. Sony was banking on that being a huge selling point, much like how the PS2 playing DVDs was. It had the best-looking games and the most USB ports. Sony knew people would flock to the PlayStation again instead of the Xbox, and they decided to make the greatest device they could because they knew people would buy it regardless of the cost, regardless of the cost. The Xbox 360 launched later in 2005, with the PlayStation 3 being slated for spring 2006 until being delayed to holiday 2006. Much like how the PS2 released a year ahead of the competition, I feel that the Xbox 360 doing the same did numbers to its success. Microsoft had a year head start on Sony, which meant by the time the PS3 would launch, they'd have a beefy library of games at their disposal, a potentially better price point of the console, a larger install base of players, which was a big deal in the era of online gaming. Plus, they were the first console to show off what, at the time, was next-gen graphics, so by the time the PS3 would come out, it wouldn't have been as revolutionary looking. But Sony couldn't care less about Microsoft, they were confident that people would drop everything in their life at the moment for the right to buy a PlayStation 3. But then during their E3 2006 press conference, Sony said, you know what, we haven't f***ed up in a while, let's do it. This conference will always live in infamy, the moment that many stopped looking at the PS3 with excitement and instead, with embarrassment. The entire presentation was awkward with how lines were delivered and the games honestly looking pretty boring. A lot of this stuff didn't look that much better than what Microsoft was putting out, which made it sting even more when it ended with a mortgage. The 20 gigabyte PlayStation 3 will retail for 499 US dollars and 549 Canadian dollars. And the 60 gigabyte PlayStation 3 for 599 US dollars, 659 dollars Canadian. Back then, I didn't even know that much money existed. To be fair, Sony was taking a loss on PlayStation 3s at that price point. These things were costing far more to produce than what they were selling them for. However, that didn't matter. It was still clear. Nobody wanted to spend $600 for the right to play this. This was when a lot of people sprung on the Xbox 360. The price point was fairly solid, and you got pretty much all the games that were coming to PS3, so... You can't blame anybody for going this route. Holiday rolled around and the PS3 launched right before the Nintendo Wii and people were going nuts. People were camping out waiting to scoop up these consoles and immediately sell them on eBay for a profit. I do this with Robitussin during flu season, I get it, but people were taking this incredibly seriously. The PS3 was expected to be a smash hit. We're a failure, I'm open to that too. For the first few years of its life, the PS3 was the laughing stock of the gaming industry. It was overpriced and didn't have a ton of compelling exclusive games. Multi-platform titles often ran worse on the system because one, the Xbox 360 was easier to develop for, so developers would make games for it first and then hastily port it over to PS3, and B, the Xbox 360 was more popular, so developers would make games for it first and then hastily port it over to PS3. I mean, that thing had a bigger library and more exclusives initially, with a lower starting price compared to the PS3. It was obvious if you wanted a new console, comparing the two, the 360 just made more sense. Didn't help the PS3 ads were f***ing weird. See, that just shows how arrogant Sony was at the time. They thought, oh, we'll creep people out with our PlayStation 3 commercials. It's the PS3, people will win it regardless. But the PS3's problems didn't mean the 360 was having the greatest of times. More and more hardware malfunctionings were occurring. This model was notorious for failures, showing off the infamous Red Ring of Death, which meant your system was pretty much donezo. While it was doing better sales-wise, Microsoft had to deal with repairs, spent a crazy amount on warranties, and overall just had to live with the bad press that 360 got when it came to reliability. So, 
one had no games, and the other didn't work. You really had to pick your poison. Within the first year, Sony took drastic steps to improve the PlayStation 3, cutting the price, removing features that were sort of worthless to reduce costs. I will never forget you, CF card reader. More and more exclusives were coming out, like Little Big Planet and Uncharted, but right when Sony was starting to turn things around, Microsoft just had to release Halo 3. This may be one of the biggest moments in gaming history, just based on the energy surrounding the launch alone. Everybody knew Halo 3 was launching. It was a big deal. But then after that, uh, Microsoft kind of gave up. The 360 no doubt had loads of fantastic exclusive games, but most of the big ones came in the first few years of that system's life. Gears of War, Viva Pinata, Crackdown, it all led up to Halo 3, and then afterwards... I mean, sequels to these games came out, but really... Microsoft kind of got content with where they were at and stopped fighting nearly as hard. Sony continued to fund exclusive games and reduced the PS3's price until finally giving it a much needed redesign that was quite a bit smaller and was featured in a new ad campaign that highlighted the system's unique features. Microsoft kept at it with redesigning the system's user interface, offering avatars like Nintendo's Miis, and focusing on media consumption with streaming apps. As time went on, it felt like the roles were reversing. Sony was trying to win over the hardcore gamer with excellent games, while Microsoft was trying to transform the Xbox 360 into this all-in-one entertainment hub for everybody, which was the initial mission statement of the PlayStation 3. Both companies tried their hands at motion controllers to combat the Nintendo Wii. Sony had the PlayStation Move and Microsoft the Kinect. While both were equally f***ing stupid in their own right, the Move felt more like a way to turn your PS3 into a Wii if you're into that sort of thing. The Kinect felt more like something Microsoft wanted everybody to have and positioned it as a replacement for the Wii. You could control the games with your body, that's insane, I f***ing hated my thumbs anyways. The Kinect did insanely well, much better than the PlayStation Move. But that came at a cost. While Sony was focusing on making legitimately good video games to win back the trust of the gaming community, Microsoft fully shifted the Xbox brand into casual all-in-one entertainment after the Kinect's success. At least they released a redesigned system that actually worked this time. The last couple years of these systems' active lives before their successors released were fairly different. Sony just kept pumping out exclusive after exclusive, getting games to come to PS3 with exclusive content, while Microsoft kept focusing on Halo, Gears of War, Forza, Kinect games with Call of Duty thrown in there with all the DLC coming to Xbox first. The 360 was still ahead, but was losing the support of the hardcore community, while Sony was doing wonders to regaining trust and rebuilding the PS3's image. While Sony still had tons of trouble occur during this time, most notably the PlayStation Network hack and outage of 2011, they stood strong and focused on making the PlayStation 3 the gamer's console. Both systems received one more redesign later in their lives, these ones focused on giving us consoles so cheap I can try to break it over my knee. Keyword try. Sony had one more ace up their sleeve with The Last of Us releasing in summer of 2013 right before the launch of their next console, the PlayStation 4. One of the most critically acclaimed games of all time as an exclusive. That got a lot of people to pick up a PlayStation 3 mere months before the next PlayStation was coming out. That's pretty impressive. And throughout all of this, while the Xbox 360 was winning the war for most of the generation, when all was said and done, it was actually Sony who ended up winning. Yeah, this is still crazy to me. I still always look at the Xbox 360 as the winner in terms of sales, and while that was true for the majority of its life, the PlayStation 3 picked up so much steam later on, it actually ended up winning. A classic underdog story. It always warms my heart to see a multi-billion dollar corporation win at the end of the day. But who really won? Sony. But who do I think wins overall? So it's come down to this. I'm gonna pit these two consoles against each other in nine categories and see which one ends up winning based on my preferences. Now my personal history with these consoles was I was always a Nintendo guy. My state's government already knows that. But in 2011, I had enough of being the only guy in school who didn't have something that couldn't play Barrel Blast. So I had to decide, did I want an Xbox 360 or a PlayStation 3? Both had used R2, so it really didn't matter. I ended up going with the Xbox 360, but always wondered if things would be different on the other side. I finally bit the bullet five years later and bought a used red PlayStation 3. I barely used this thing. But this is the perfect opportunity to play this for the first time and play this to bring back memories and see which one comes out on top. Both of these systems have had three different designs released throughout their lives, and the first iterations are both absolutely iconic. This system looks like a fun box. This system looks like a space heater. I don't think the original PS3 looks bad by any means, but it looks like it's trying its hardest to look futuristic and expensive, and just ended up looking like it really wanted to be taken seriously and instead got called a f***ing grill. Both of these are pretty beefy consoles. I mean, I'd be worried if I swallowed one. I do think the original Xbox 360 had more of a personality, though. You could swap out the faceplates. I think every company tries this at least once, and then never again, but this was a neat little idea. At least the PS3's PlayStation logo could be rotated based on its orientation. 
yeah, we need new models. The slim variants of both systems. Now, I will say both of these were desperately needed. The PS3 needed a more cost-effective and attractive model, and the 360 needed a model that actually worked. Definitely, the 360S was the most necessary revision, with the original being plagued by the red ring of death, no Wi-Fi built in, no HDMI built in, yeah. Yeah, this is definitely needed. But the least expensive model only had four gigabytes of storage. Oh, that's worthless. Now, to be fair, around 2007, Microsoft released the Xbox 360 Elite with HDMI built in. Still the original design, I'm worried this is gonna catch on fire and I don't even own one. The PS3 Slim, while it was a bit of a stripped down version in comparison to the original, it was an excellent upgrade in terms of aesthetics. This system looks so good and still retains a lot of the character of the original model. Of course, you can always go cheaper, so Sony released the PS3 Super Slim, please go back. So this is kinda cute, look at this, it's like a bathroom stall. The disc tray is a bit problematic on here, it's not terrible, but it's so much cheaper, it's so much louder. Half the time when I open it, pop a disc in and shut it, it doesn't shut all the way and I have to nudge it slightly to get it to close properly. And this one started at 12 gigabytes of storage, oh, yes! Now this was obviously made to be a super cheap entry level PS3. It's nowhere near as sturdy or substantial feeling as the Slim or the original. I can't say this is a bad option to have, it's still a PS3, it's fine. I like that they tried something different and stupid, but it is undoubtedly the cheapest feeling one. It just doesn't feel like it matters. Well, Microsoft decided to complain play a shitty third consoles and came up with this during sleep paralysis. The Xbox 360E. This is one of my least favorite looking consoles of all time. This released the same year as the Xbox One, so they decided to redesign the 360 to look more like the Xbox One, and who doesn't want to look more like the original Xbox One? The 360 has had a great look. I liked how sleek it was, how it was subtly X-shaped. That was great. So why do this? It just looks confused and scared. So both consoles had ups and downs with their designs, but if I had to choose one, I'd say the PS3 was the most consistently solid. I don't hate any of these designs. The Super Slim is totally cheap and the original is totally fat, but I think they all look at the very least fine. I really do like that original 360 design, but it didn't have Wi-Fi, HDMI, it was on its deathbed as soon as you bought it. It had problems, and while the S was a great upgrade to reliability features and overall design, the E just completely ruined the 360's chance here. The controller is what makes video games a thumb man's game. The Xbox 360 is often cited as having one of the best controllers of all time. It just feels so substantial. The button placement, the sticks, triggers, everything feels perfect. Of course, it does have some issues. The D-pad is on a similar level to Vlad the Impaler. They updated it later on to be a transforming D-pad, swing it around to be actively okay. It uses AA batteries for power, which was a bit outdated even for the time. Microsoft would later release play and charge kits though, which allowed you to simply use a rechargeable battery. You had to pay extra for it, but at least you had the option. But overall, this is still easily one of the greatest controllers out there. Now on a completely unrelated note, the PlayStation 3 controller. So it initially released as the 6-axis, which had no rumble. That got updated to the DualShock 3, which was everything the 6-axis was, but with rumble. I was waiting to be confused today. But all PS3 controllers basically look the same, which means they all look the same as PS2 controllers, which look the same as PS1 controllers, which were basically the same as a Super Nintendo controller. Sony used the exact same controller design for three consoles at this point. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, sure, but they kept cramming these modern technologies into a decade old design and because of that it was easy to see some cracks forming it's a bit small for my liking i was never the biggest fan of the thumbstick placements they added analog triggers but the way they're designed make it easy for your fingers to slip off of them there's also not as much weight to this controller as the 360s which makes this feel a lot flimsier and more fragile just holding it you can feel how easy it would be to snap this in two with the 360 controller i don't feel it at all now the controller is rechargeable out of the box which is a nice feature however while the battery life is pretty all right the 360 controller with double A's lasted quite a bit longer. Now PS3 does have motion controls. You can tilt the controller around, but my holy sh god is it gimmicky. I find it funny how people considered the Wii gimmicky back then, and justifiably so. But the PS3 controller had motion controls as well, and every implementation I've seen of motion controls with this controller were some of the most unnecessary garbage of all time. At least the Wii had bowling going for it. Now the PS3 controller does look pretty classy. It looks more elegant. If a 360 controller's on your couch, I immediately think you cheat on your girlfriend and your fingernails look disgusting. This has more class. But it's still better in nearly every way to me. Better layout, better feel, better battery life, no unnecessary gimmicks, a few little issues, but this is pretty damn near close to perfect. The PS3 controller isn't bad, but it's just not as rock solid as the competition. The Xbox 360 had so many accessories. A way to play HD movies, a Wi-Fi adapter, did the PS3 have those? Oh. The PlayStation 3 was the ultimate package. You could play Blu-rays right out of the box, use HDMI, connect to Wi-Fi, play PS1 games, PS2 games, everything. 
as long as you had the best models. So some of these features, namely Wi-Fi connectivity and PS2 game support, were taken out of lower end PS3s originally to make them as cheap as possible. That does make buying these older models a bit more confusing, as most people don't really know how to differentiate a PS2 compatible Wi-Fi enabled PS3 in the wild. That's why it's easier to compare the features of the second revisions of each console onwards, and easily the PS3 still has the most features. Of course, Blu-ray support out of the box. Now, the Xbox 360 had an adapter to play HD DVDs, you're welcome humanity, but the fact you had to buy a separate disk drive for a soon to be obsolete format at the time, it just didn't stack up to the PS3. That was one of the biggest draws for the system, the Blu-ray support. It was the only system to have it at the time and it was a great feature. Of course, you had the Xbox Live Vision camera, which was just a garbage webcam, you can't forget that. PS3 had the PlayStation Eye, but both of these evolved into the major accessories for the console, the Kinect and PlayStation Move. The Kinect was a camera that could sense your whole body. You could control the games with no controller. The PlayStation Move used the PlayStation Eye to read wands. And the Kinect automatically had more marketing potential and definitely did better right out the gate. The Move was a fine accessory, but it more so felt like a way to let the PS3 play Wii type games. The Kinect, as terrible as it could be, allowed for much more possibilities with games not playable with standard controllers. But at least the PlayStation Move didn't take its company and obliterate it for four years straight. Kinect forced Microsoft into a casual entertainment perspective and made them lack ambition in the gaming landscape. The PlayStation Move, while it wasn't as exciting at the time, it was used in less offensive ways. It was often just an option and it worked well for the most part. It was a side thing for Sony rather than their core focus, but Kinect had more games for it that I think justified a purchase. Like why would you buy a PlayStation Move to make people leave your house? There just wasn't a ton of compelling software for it. Now, Kinect had a ton more absolute garbage, but it at least justified itself with some titles, plus the idea was more novel than PlayStation Move. With that said, I think all the features packed into the PlayStation 3, plus its motion controller being non-obtrusive and fine. I think I'll give the features and accessories point to PS3. Kinect had more purpose, but it was bogged down with imprecise controls, terrible games, and overall tanking Microsoft's image in the latter half of the 360's life. Games like Kinect Sports and Dance Central may have been decent enough to warrant a purchase and were more iconic than the entirety of games that required PlayStation Move, but they just aren't a big enough deal to really make me vastly prefer the Kinect to the Move. I could go with one or the other most of the time, but with the PS3's suite of features, I think it takes this round. Which of these systems is the easiest to use while well, not compromising on options? Well, the 360's user interface has changed three times throughout the years, each one having their own fans until landing on this one. Honestly, I never had much of a problem with this interface. It's quick and snappy, everything is laid out in an understandable fashion, it makes sense. I don't think I've had to look up where certain things are on Google or anything. A few more advertisements than I'd prefer, but hey, this works quite well. The PS3 has had the cross-media bar since launch. It's updated a bit, but it's generally been the same vibe throughout the years. I do like this. I think it's well thought out and makes sense. You have all the general things you can do on the left and right, and then up and down are the options within the option you've selected. Though I do think that this interface is a bit bland compared to all of the 360s, and it does have a bit too many options. If we go to settings, it's really difficult to tell which setting is the specific setting you want to use. It's great if you really want to get down and dirty with your PS3, but if I want to adjust something, half the time I don't know which option to pick. I definitely have to Google how to adjust things every time, but hey, at least we have tons of things to mess around with. But holy sh do I hate using this thing. The PS3 is a temperamental child. There's always something going on with it. Of course, the infamous updates. Pretty much every time I boot a game up, there's an update. There's something I have to install. Of course, most of the time I can't do anything in the background. I have to sit and watch this thing load. And this thing freezes up so much more than the 360. Installing, loading, updates. I'm always at the edge of my seat when the PS3 is doing any of this because there's a solid chance something's gonna go wrong. The Xbox 360 is simpler and just works most of the time. I pop in a game. If it has to update, it downloads it pretty fast barely any games have to install stuff, its user interface is simple but gives me the options I want. The PS3 is in the top 40 worst PlayStation consoles, but on a more positive note, it's in the top 40 best. Online play was incredibly important during this generation. I should know, I barely used it. But both of these systems did lean heavily into the online multiplayer crowd. If you were buying one of these systems, you gave a shit. Xbox 360 was generally considered the king of online multiplayer. Connection was great, the interface for setting up parties and hopping into games was simple and intuitive, good stuff. PS3 wasn't bad, but wasn't as elegant and wasn't nearly as feature packed as the 360 was in its early years. It took a while, but the PS3 eventually got everything together and was pretty competent. But there was one big point against Xbox Live, you had to pay for it. No. 
Oh, no, that's not fair. I have a mouth to feed. Xbox Live Gold was $60 a year. Now, per year, that's not too bad. That's pretty reasonable. But if you wanted a slightly spottier service for free a year, you could buy a PS3 and spend that $60 you would have spent on online multiplayer on a new video game. Instead, you could have paid for surgery. Now, Sony did offer a paid online service, PlayStation Plus. This service gave you the ability to play betas for upcoming games, gave you exclusive sale prices for games, and updates could be downloaded to your console automatically instead of having to sit through it every time. You had to pay for that? The biggest deal was that you would get free games every month downloaded to your system for as long as you kept your Plus membership. Xbox would later offer monthly free games for Xbox Live Gold members in 2013, right before their next console would come out great. PlayStation Plus was kinda cool, but they lacked some weird features behind a premium paywall. But just to watch something like Netflix on the Xbox 360, something you already had to pay for monthly, you needed a gold subscription. That's dumb. But if I had to choose between the two, the 360 did have the better online component. Both did some dumb things, but we're also used to paying for online multiplayer now that it's not that big of a deal. Generally speaking, which console looked the best? Well, most people probably know the PlayStation 3 was more powerful than the Xbox 360. Yes, most people. Ask Scott Asner, he'd know. But when you compare the two, they are pretty on par with each other. While many PS3 exclusives looked phenomenal at the time, 360 games didn't look that much worse. In fact, because the 360 had a bigger install base for most of its life and was easier to develop for, most third-party games ended up looking better on 360 because they were made with that hardware in mind. Now, this isn't a huge deal. By better, I really mean we're splitting hairs here, but 360 does look slightly nicer. Playing something like Bioshock Infinite on the PS3, I do notice a lot more dirty-looking textures compared to the 360 version. Third-party games look and run a bit better on 360 most of the time. And while there are a handful of cases where the PS3 version of a game is drastically worse than the 360 one, most of the time, it's not that noticeable. Playing the PS3 version isn't much different at all from the 360 one. But the developers working exclusively with the PS3, the developers who actually took the time to figure out how to use the system to the best of its abilities, my god. Some of these games look just as good as PlayStation 4 titles. Just comparing two exclusives for each system that released in 2011, Gears of War 3 and Uncharted 3, Uncharted does look better to me. But the 360 can do some really impressive stuff, like really impressive. Just look at Rise of the Tomb Raider on the system from 2015. This was an Xbox One game, but the 360 version looks incredible for the console. And it doesn't even require an install or multiple discs. The Xbox 360 can put out some crazy graphics, but the PlayStation 3 at its best will always look a little bit better to me. God, I hope my new video game console can play my older games even though I'll never play them. Backwards compatibility is such a luxury to have even if you barely use it. And the PlayStation 3 initially was set to be the ultimate PlayStation. It could play all generations. And then the PS2 support was taken out of the cheaper models to cut costs. And then they got rid of it entirely. But hey, the Xbox 360 can play original Xbox games. This is the ultimate pleasure. Could you imagine a worse note to get on your windshield? So both consoles have trouble with playing older games. All PS3s play PS1 discs, but a specific version of the original model is the only one that can play PS2 games. Some PS1 and PS2 games are available to download from the PlayStation Network store, and various PS2 games were re-released in high definition via collections, so regardless, you had some options on PS3. The Xbox 360 can play a little less than half of the original Xbox library. Microsoft would update the 360 every now and then, offering more and more original Xbox games that were supported until they just gave up. Even though most of the major Xbox releases you'd care to play are supported, many of them have issues. The Wikipedia list of the Xbox games that were backwards compatible has a specific column denoting issues, so that says it all right there. However, those games run fine enough. Many older titles were re-released via downloads on Xbox Live Arcade and PlayStation Network, and while Xbox Live Arcade was easily the more popular of the two, most legacy titles appeared on both services. These two both have their problems with playing legacy content, but the PS3 had the most options and always supported PS1 discs. I already talked about how third-party multi-platform games generally looked and ran better on Xbox 360, and yeah, that's generally the case. Sometimes third-party games have to install trash on PS3, but they just immediately boot on the 360. Like, come on. Most of the time, the graphical differences are incredibly minor. It's to the point where I'd say, if you're playing a third-party game on PS3, you don't have much to worry about. 
is not a big deal. But to combat any graphical differences, many third-party PS3 games offer exclusive content, whether that's exclusive characters in fighting games, exclusive missions and modes, PlayStation Move support, that's all pretty cool. Xbox 360 versions really didn't have much to offer in comparison. I mean, Call of Duty DLC came to Xbox first, oh jeez, I better get Black Ops 2 in 2020. But most of the time, PS3 offered legitimate gameplay reasons to want to own that version instead of the 360 one. Even having PlayStation Move support in Bioshock Infinite, that's way cooler than offering Kinect support in Mass Effect 3, where it's literally just screeching at your Xbox to make choices on screen. Hey, some people like playing shooters with motion controls. It was a cooler incentive than noise complaints. However, a lot of these exclusive features didn't amount to a lot. They were cool incentives, but to be honest, most third-party games were made for Xbox 360, and thus, they just work better on the platform. Most major third-party games came to each console. You weren't missing out on much if you were a big THQ nut and you owned a 360. What this all boils down to is, which console had the best exclusive games? The Xbox 360 had Halo, Gears of War, Fable, Forza, Crackdown. The PlayStation 3 had Uncharted, Resistance, Little Big Planet, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, Killzone, Infamous, God of War, Metal Gear Solid 4, Gran Turismo, Mod Nation Racers, Puppeteer, The Last of Us, okay. Okay, this may be a bit unfair. To give Microsoft credit, they did quite a good job in the first half of the 360's life with exclusives. I mean, Halo 3 launching will always be one of the biggest events in gaming history. Even looking at the best PlayStation 3 exclusives, they just don't hold a candle to the amount of excitement around the world for that one game. Gears of War was huge, and Forza took over the racing sim crown from Gran Turismo. Like, my god, they had Forza games releasing every single year, and the Gran Turismo team was just like, here's a prequel to Gran Turismo 5, because for some reason we're taking 20 years to make it. And then for some reason they put out Gran Turismo 6 after the PlayStation 4 launched. With digital bite-sized titles, Xbox Live Arcade was far better. They had so many fun experiences on there. Uh, PSN? Eh. They secured games like Bioshock and Mass Effect. Mass Effect 2 was exclusive for a year. Now, each of these games came to PS3 eventually, and timed exclusives aren't my idea for a fun afternoon, but it at least showed they meant business. They got Grand Theft Auto to jump away from being a timed PlayStation exclusive franchise. They got Final Fantasy to come to Xbox finally. They really cared, and then they gave up. Once Kinect rolled around, they let their guard down, and while Sony was already starting to kill it, they really went crazy funding exclusive content. Not only were they making amazing exclusive games, but sequels to those games, and not only were these games great, but they had a huge variety of games exclusive to PlayStation 3. There's a reason the only things people think about when Xbox is brought up are Halo, Gears of War, and Forza. Connect exclusives could be sort of cute, but right when I said that, Sony put out The Last of Us. Jesus. One of the most critically acclaimed games of all time. That got so many people to buy a PS3. And then you had some of the more unknown games. Puppeteer is really charming. And not all PS3 exclusives were winners. Some of them definitely missed the mark, but many PS3 exclusives were truly experiences worth investing in a PS3 for. The PS3 may have been rough around the edges and difficult to use in many areas, but I don't even have to finish this sentence. So the PS3 won, which is weird considering that I used a 360 back in the day. Uh, to be fair, it could have gone either way, but based on my personal taste at the moment, I think the PS3 comes out on top. Even if it's an absolute bitch to use. But turns out I'm not blinded by nostalgia or love for a specific company. I picked the PS3 when the 360 was the console I owned. So that's a plus to my reviewing skills. The only thing the PS3 could use is a version of Mario Party 9. This game's actually terrible, but I love it because it's made by Nintendo.